So I want to make sure we stay on time. I know uh, a lot of folks want to speak, so we want to make sure we give everyone a chance. My name is uh, Mike Ludwig. I'm the mayor. Thank you for coming. Again, so we're going to, this is the state of, uh, state of Connecticut going to talk about the road diet that was in a, um, you know, in a paper. If we could, this, how the meeting is going to go, they're going to do their presentation, uh, show, you know, kind of what their plans are and to talk through that. Then at the end, we'll have plenty of time. We'll facilitate. We'll have a mic. We're just going to hand it to you. And then one question at a time. So again, we keep it orderly. So just if you could hold your comments and your questions to the end. So again, let them get through their presentation. Welcome them to Enfield. They're, you know, they're here. You know, again, you'll have plenty of time to ask all the questions that you would like. We're going to try to, you know, keep it orderly, move it along, and make sure everyone gets a chance to speak who has a question. And that's the goal here. All right. So if, uh, again, we can just ask you just to let uh, them go through their presentation. Right. If you submitted questions prior, you know, you certainly can ask them when we come to the mic or if you have a question that comes you know, to your mind after seeing a presentation. So a little bit informal, but if we could just keep it orderly so everyone gets a chance to speak. Obviously, very important presentation for Enfield, but of course for Route 5 specifically, but Enfield as a whole. So again, thank you very much for coming. I'm going to turn it over to Ken Lucier from the Department of uh, Transportation from Connecticut. And again, um, thank you, sir, for coming to Enfield. Thank you, Mayor Mark, uh, Mike. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for all coming tonight. We got a pretty uh, good crowd, so I, I guess you're all very interested in what we're proposing. Uh, my name is Ken Lucier. Uh, I'm an engineer with the Connecticut Department of Transportation, and I'm joined by Chris Granatini from Tyne and Bond Engineers and Mike Morehouse from uh, Fitzgerald and Halliday. Uh, this, uh, the Connecticut Department of Transportation hired these two firms to conduct uh, roadway uh, a road diet feasibility studies on all four-lane undivided roadways throughout all of Connecticut, one of which is uh, U.S. Route 5 here. Uh, first, again, thank you uh, to the town for uh, setting up this meeting and giving us this opportunity to let us present to you our proposed uh, concept. Um, Uh, first, I, I need to note uh, that the Connecticut DOT is committed uh, to ensuring that no person uh, shall, on the basis of race, color, or na uh, national origin, be excluded from participation or subject to discrimination in the development of this project. Um, there are civil rights flyers up here available, as well as surveys. If you, uh, if you want to fill them out, you could uh, hand them to me at the end of the, uh, the presentation or at the end of the evening or you can mail them in, or you could um, email them in uh, as well. So again, they're, they're uh, optional. You don't need to fill them out. But we are obligated to uh, have these uh, here for you if, you if you feel the need to uh, fill them out. <coughs> so uh, the uh, Connecticut DOT is planning to repave Route 5, beginning at Route 190, which is Hazard Avenue, and going all the way up to the Massachusetts border. Uh, it's approximately two and a half miles uh, and the purpose of the, for the repaving is to um, improve the roadway surface uh, and the pavement markings. Um, during these uh, repaving projects, uh, there's an opportunity to, uh, to revise the existing pavement markings to improve safety and, uh, and operations. The 1.6-mile uh, segment between uh, Grant Street uh, Grant Avenue uh, to University Place uh, has been identified as having the potential to be, con to be converted from a four-lane roadway to a three-lane roadway consisting of one travel lane in each direction, a center left turn lane, and wider shoulders for pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, reducing the number of travel lanes and repurposing the extra space um, uh, is what uh, for you know for additional travel modes is what we refer to as a road diet. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris or Mike. I'll go first. Okay, and they'll they'll get into uh, more of the details in our proposal. And again, it's 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 a uh, it's these are concept plans. Uh, it's a proposal. Nothing is set in stone. Uh, ultimately, the town is going to make the final decision on whether. Uh, they want the, the department to move forward with the road diet or, or not. So once again, I'm Chris Granatini. I'm a senior project manager with Ty and Bond uh, out of Middletown. 
So tonight we're here to present to you the project, um, and I'll walk you through what the goals of this meeting are. Uh, we're also going to go through a little session of just kind of giving the public and you guys some information about the benefits of road diets, um, just so that you have some knowledge about why we're looking at this for this roadway. Uh, and then I'll walk you through the screening process that Ty and Bond went through to select this segment of Route 5 for the road diet. I'll walk you through the engineering analysis that we conducted, um, which is the basis of why we recommended to the department that they could move forward with this uh, potential improvement. Um, and then I'll show you some of the concepts, um, and then we'll open it up to questions and answers at the end. Um, so we're here to receive feedback from you. We want to hear your perspectives. It's important. It's important to the department. It's important to us in the planning process. Uh, we want to educate you on what road diets are. Um, we'll give you some national information. So this is not just something that the state of Connecticut is taking up. Um, road diets are a, uh, a proven safety countermeasure from the Federal Highway Administration. So this is one of the techniques that the federal government has identified to improve safety on roadways. And there's a series of other ones, but we're looking at the road diet tonight. <clears throat> and then, like I said, I'll walk you through the results. So the objective is to uh, develop a statewide road diet program to improve safety. Um, safety is, uh, in our minds as engineers, paramount. Um, it's the protection of life. It's protecting people from injuries and accidents. And so when we look at transportation improvements, safety is always first in our mind. Um, and so the idea of the project is to convert the four-lane road to a three-lane road. Uh, and we'll explain to you kind of how that will happen. Um, and then you have additional width that's remaining. So when you go from four lanes to three lanes, you have additional space in the roadway. And so for this project, we're converting the additional space to wide shoulders, which could accommodate bike traffic. Um, it provides a buffer between sidewalks and the vehicles. Um, and you'll see some things about how a four lane road, a lot of times will really act like a three lane road in its function. Um, we're looking to you know, reduce travel speed. So I'm sure that everybody has the experience of driving on a four lane road like this and people are passing you and, and you know, so, so the inside lane functions as like a passing lane um, and that is a safety concern for us. Um, so we wanna reduce travel speeds uh, to closer to the speed limit. We wanna reduce the number and severity of crashes um, and improve safety and mobility for alternative travel modes. So bikers, pedestrians and transit um, and like Ken said, this is a low cost improvement because they're gonna do the repaving and it's just, how do we stripe the road when the project's done? So they're gonna come through and do the paving and do the restriping and we're here to decide what will the striping look like when the project is done. <clears throat> so I've got a quick little video. <clears throat> My daily bike commute starts out about uh, five in the morning and I leave uh, my house and I go about five miles down paths and streets until I connect with a bus center. I've had a couple of close calls where I really had to hit the brakes hard. Well, when I'm crossing a four lane road in the city, sometimes I get a little nervous because I'm not really sure if the cars can see me. Sometimes I don't always have enough time to cross the street and I'm always a little worried that I'm going to get hit this area the roads are always busy there's always a lot of traffic out there and drivers here they make poor choices they're weaving in and out of traffic slamming on brakes to quickly stop because they miss their turn or they're distracted because they're doing other things in the car there's a lot of reasons why a community might want to build a road diet but it's actually considerably safer to build a street with a road diet configuration rather than a conventional four-lane undivided section. It's a great opportunity to combine the need for bike infrastructure with the goal to help improve traffic safety. The reason that uh, road diets are considered, at least from our agency standpoint, uh, a, big, a big benefit is the safety benefit. So having four lanes instead of three or two lanes allows people to weave through traffic and so you end up with side swipes. And by having a road diet, you eliminate those conflicts 
uh, by going to a three-lane cross-section, you now provide a turn lane so that people can move over to make left turns and you don't have those rearing crashes. The other benefit that you get typically is speed reduction uh, on the Robinson Street Road Diet and on the Gaines Street Road Diet here in Tallahassee. When you go down to having only two travel lanes, the prudent driver who will drive the speed limit now controls the platoon speed basically meaning that the platoons of cars can't travel any faster than the prudent driver. If we determine that the street will work well from an engineering perspective, then we want to get together with the community and talk about the various configurations that might be available. Uh, we'll work with the elected officials that represent that community to um, talk about whether it might make more sense to change the configuration. I think one of the things that's important is the street belongs to the community. And we want to involve the community in every decision we make. You can really see a dramatic increase in the diversity of people using the sidewalks from strollers, joggers, people walking their dogs in a way that uh, even 10 years ago you wouldn't have seen in this community. I think road diets are going to have a positive impact on the transportation system as a whole. Bicycling on the redeveloped roadways around Phoenix that have been on a road diet is a huge improvement. Number one, it gives me a barrier. It gives me my own lane that is reserved strictly for cyclists. Crossing the street with a road diet is a lot easier now. If I don't make it across the intersection in time, there's a place in the middle for me to stand. That way I feel like the cars can see me better and I don't have to worry about getting hit by a car. I feel much safer. I think road diets have really made an improvement. Um, the traffic flows better. Having that dedicated turn lane has really helped reduce some of the stress and it's made it easier for people to get to where they're going. And I didn't think it would work, but having those less lanes has really helped. People can't weave in and out of traffic, and I really feel safer on the road. <coughs> so why are we considering road diets? Do you want to? So this is Mike Morehouse from Fitzgerald and Halliday, and he'll take us through the next part of the presentation. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good evening, everybody. How are you? Good. Good? Good. I'm going to have uh, Parker help me out here. Um, so there's a number of reasons. That video, I thought, was a great video to explain what road diets are. But I think beyond that, I think the Department of Transportation, we as consultants, we have a professional and, and ethical responsibility to do what you know we think is the safest. Um, you know, we never want to prioritize one person's mobility over another person's safety. Uh, furthermore, um, you know, mobility shouldn't come at the expense of injury, loss of human life. And when we see four-lane roads, oftentimes that's what results. The, the crashes tend to be more frequent, more severe. Um, and we also have to think about other road users. Um, I know we all probably drive in this room. I don't know how many of you take transit, bike, walk, uh, but there are people that do use the road, and we all have a right to the road. And we have to think about the vulnerable users, the underrepresented uh, populations who don't often have a say in how our roads are designed. So it's very important we think about all these. So it's, it's almost even a moral imperative um, uh, for us as designers. So we're here just to present some data, uh, some concepts we want to share with you. And uh, we think we'll, you know, these ideas will make Route 5 safer. However, we're here to listen to you. This is your community. It's your choice whether to support this alternative or not. But uh, just to start the conversation, we want to kind of get everybody at the same level of understanding of what the road diet is. I think all that stuff that was presented did a pretty good job. But we have a, we have a few more slides to share with you. Um, go on. One more. But before we get into that, I just want to, uh, I think it's important to back up and just to explain what the purpose of streets is. A colleague of mine did these cartoons. I think they do a good job of illustrating, really, um, our streets have for thousands of years been designed for human interaction, for economic and social exchange. It's only been the last hundred years or so since the advent of the automobile that we really started using streets purely for mobility. Uh, clearly, streets have to um, accommodate buses, trucks, cars. Um, but also the people that use them, different users, bicyclists, pedestrians, uh, children, people of all ages and abilities. Uh, but increasingly, we also have to start to think about the static users of the street. These are the places alongside our streets, our institutions, our shopping areas, recreational areas, uh, houses, and so forth. And when you add all these things together, this is what creates a place. So our streets are very, very vital public spaces. Um, this chart is something that, you know, 
we've all, as engineers, seen in our course books as we went through universities, and um, it's basically the, the explains the function of streets. And really what it says, it's very simple, is our arterial roads are all about throughput, our local streets are all about access, you know, driveways to our homes and so forth, and then collectors fall somewhere in the middle. But increasingly, this is, is wrong. This has been in the, in the traffic textbooks for years and years and years, and we've designed roads based on this, and, and it turns out to be wrong. Um, and you only need to look at aerial photography to understand that. Uh, this happens to be Buffalo, New York, but you can see where all the arterial roads are in Buffalo, New York, because it's where all the light-colored buildings are. Those are the places that you want to access. Those are your schools and your parks and your restaurants and uh, shopping centers and so forth, and they're, they're quite easy to see. Uh, other cities, same thing. I think that's Detroit. Um, and if you go to Enfield, uh, even though it's a little bit more suburban in character, you can still see very clearly where 190 and 220 is. And uh, even up here, uh, Route 5, where we are tonight, uh, that's where a lot of access is required. So uh, again, if that original graphic was true, that road should be all about throughput and nothing about access. But it's not that way at all. In fact, it should look something more like this, where our arterials probably have the highest degree of access, and they also have an important throughput role, of course, um, but, but access is very important. And local roads are more about access, but they also have a little bit of a throughput component. We know that to be true. So we explain this. The typical four, uh, road diet that we often uh, use is going from four lanes down to three lanes. So a center turn lane, which allows us the ability to provide other uses along the side, whether that be a bike lane or wider sidewalks or a bigger shoulder or what have you. So what are the benefits? We, there's typically four types of benefits that we attribute to road diets. Improved safety, improved operations, bicycle pedestrian benefits, and overall livability. Just going to go through each one of those. So one of the things um, we, we often look at with four-lane roads, so this is another project we did, is the multiple thread intersection. This is when a vehicle comes out of a side street, a driveway. And what they have to do is, if you're making a left, you have to contend with two lanes of oncoming traffic and one lane of traffic in the direction you're going. So finding a gap in three lanes of traffic is very, very difficult, it especially if traffic is going at a high rate of speed. Um, what usually results is these vehicles get frustrated, they get impatient that they can't find a gap, they eventually take a risk, and then they get sideswiped or they get uh, T-boned. And, and those tend to be a little bit more severe in, in terms of crashes. Another type is uh, almost the opposite. When a vehicle is turning into an unsignalized side street or a driveway, oftentimes what you'll see is the vehicle will you know, slow down in the opposite direction, wave the person on, but they can't see the vehicle in the curb sign lane coming down. This is a video we took, uh, a drone video of another project. Parker, you can play this. What will show exactly what's happened, and we use computer software to track all these vehicles. So this vehicle is waiting to turn. That would have been a collision if that person hadn't seen him. But this person waved him on. He came. They were fortunately going at a low enough speed that we avoid a collision. But, but that doesn't always happen. So that's the other kind of crash that we see a lot of. The other thing that's important is speed reduction. Chris talked about this a lot. And the, the problem with, with high speeds is that you know, we as humans have very poor reaction time at higher speeds. Our peripheral vision is often uh, diminished greatly at higher speeds. So when we're going slow, we can see everything that's happening. We can see the road. We can see what's happening on the edge of the, of the road. But as we start increasing in speeds, what happens is our peripheral vision narrows. We focus basically at the road ahead of us. We can't see the bicyclists and the pedestrians and the other users of the road coming into the road environment. Furthermore, we're going faster. Our brakes are mechanical. They can't slow us in time. Uh, crash risk becomes very high. And this is just an example of a crash, distri crash type distribution. This is from, again, another project. We study a lot of these roads around the state. Usually on major roads, you see a lot of rear end crashes for the most part. But on four lane roads, what you see is a majority of turning related crashes, side swipe, turning intersections, turning opposite directions. This is for those reasons that I shared with you. A lot of vehicles are conflicting with each other, uh, making turns, crossing through multiple lanes, and they're getting hit. So just a quick case study. This is, a, uh, this is Lawyers Road in uh, Virginia. VDOT did the same thing that Condot's doing. They looked at resurfacing a road and decided to restripe it uh, with, as a road diet. Uh, at first, there was a number, there was some opposition to it. Uh, but of course, afterwards, they saw a 70% reduction in crashes. Uh, they put bicycle lanes, which nobody thought were needed. But then, of course, when they put them in, people started bicycling. Um, so, so overall, it was, a, it was a successful project. They, uh, they kept it in place. 
In Orlando, Edgewater Drive is another famous example. This is just an example of how crash rates diminished before and after road diets. So the overall crash rate on Edgewater went down 34%, and the uh, injury rate went down almost 70%. So what that equates to is basically every two and a half days there was a crash. After the road diet, it was every four days. Injuries that used to occur every nine days went to 30 days. Didn't, didn't completely eliminate crashes or injuries, but it certainly reduced them. Um, there's one myth when it comes to operations is that when you take away a lane, you reduce the capacity of your road. Now, at a certain volume, that is very, very much true. But for most uh, road diet conditions, we find that what happens is a four-lane road, all lanes don't act the same. The center lanes actually act as left turn lanes in a lot of cases because vehicles are pulling into driveways. Um, we did a measurement with that drone software that we showed you, and what we found was where there are driveways, 70 to 80 percent of all the traffic are on these outside lanes. So, you know, you would think, well, do I really need four lanes? And that's what that's where this type of concept comes into play. Those left turning vehicles get out of the way. The traffic in the uh, the through lanes is smoother and more predictable. The other thing is, next slide, please, is that intersections really determine the true capacity of a road. So, um, you know, you might have four lanes or two lanes in each direction. What happens is when you get to a traffic signal, that's where all your capacity is. It's, it's, it's almost halved or less than halved as soon as you have a cross street governed by a signal. With a road diet, we can go from something like this to something where we add dedicated turn pockets, something which you'll see uh, tonight. And that was exactly what was done in South Chicago with Wabash Avenue. They went through a road diet. They actually saw an increase in throughput after the road diet. They were able to put in a bike lane, a protected bike lane actually with a buffer, and actually capacity went up. And the reason is they did that at the intersections. They actually provided dedicated turn lanes so all the intersections worked better, and they didn't need all of the lanes in between the intersections to convey that level of traffic. Uh, thirdly, bicycle pedestrian improvements. So not only do road diets offer the opportunity to provide uh, accommodations for bikes and pedestrians, but they also tend to calm traffic, which is something that if you're a cyclist, you know high-speed traffic is, is pretty scary to ride in. Uh, road diets reduce crashes, and, and this is uh, something we looked at in, in West Hartford where uh, kids couldn't ride their bike to school, although this is a residential neighborhood. Road diet, uh, although this, this will be going on a trial next year, I believe, um, this provides an opportunity to do something with maybe a side path or bike lanes to, uh, to help you know, children get off these narrow sidewalks and onto something safer. Um, Reno, Wells Avenue, same thing, that's what they did. They took a four-lane section. They were able to really do a lot of, uh, not only accommodate bicyclists with bike lanes, but they could put in curb extensions, they put in medians, crosswalks, pedestrian refuges. Overall, they made uh, the entire road safer. They saw a 30% decrease in crashes, uh, reduced pedestrian crashes by over 50%, and speeds reduced from five to nine miles per hour. And finally, livability. This is the last major point. Um, Again, there's kind of a myth that road diets will cause a diversion in traffic, will hurt economic development. We've heard business owners say, you know, we're going to have less traffic in front of my, my, uh, my business. You know, my sales are going to go down. That's mostly false. Sometimes road diets do divert traffic, um, but there are a lot of cases where they don't. Uh, and and this, this one actually was Stoneway, Seattle, 13,000 vehicles, roughly what you have out here on, um, on, on Route 5. Uh, actually, they thought all this, there was a lot of opposition. They thought all of the neighborhoods adjacent to this road were going to uh, see an increase in traffic. None of that happened. Instead, what they saw is the highest offenders speeders um, reduced, the collisions reduced, pedestrians became safer, bicycle volume, I think, increased by over 50 percent, no diversions, and they maintained their peak hour capacity. Uh, you can go past this one, too. Same thing. And another study, um, this is in Indianapolis, but what they did was they used road diets, much wider roads, but they were able to carve out enough space for a dedicated pathway. And um, the reason I want to show you this is because oftentimes people think, well, what kind of economic development opportunities can we see if we, if we rethink our streets? Well, we've seen um, communities have done this, where they've had vacant buildings, vacant residences, and all of a sudden they provide bicycle infrastructure, and those people who want that infrastructure start to move in. Um, that's exactly what happened here in Indianapolis. They actually, all the property around the street decreased while this street actually increased, and then they got over 300 million in new investment. 
different scale than Enfield, but but certainly Enfield is is a town that is evolving, that is growing and, and attracting uh, uh, new people. So, you know, definitely we want to think about that aspect of road diets. Are there disadvantages? Uh, of course, we can't do a road diet everywhere. Um, road diets can increase travel time. Uh, I, I choose the word travel time and not delay for a reason because delay is a rather arbitrary thing. What, is, what are we delaying? Are we traveling 15 miles over the speed limit? So if we're only doing 10 miles over the speed limit, that's considered delay? Or are we measuring it against some arbitrary posted speed? So travel time can decrease, but that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it, it could be a matter of seconds. Would you trade 30 seconds of travel time um, for uh, a safer bike lane or for better pedestrian crossings? Those are the kind of questions we have to ask ourselves when we think about uh, road diets. Potential for locking lefts. So you saw that left turn in the middle. That's locations where you might have driveways that create the, the uh, condition where two vehicles are kind of fighting for the same space and then they, they get stuck. Um, that's a design issue, something that we'd have to work out and it's something that Chris and his, his group has worked out, but that's, all, that's one of the potential disadvantages. And then, and then confusion. Some people who are not familiar with these types of cross sections could see, uh, could be initially confused. Although uh, I, I think it's, you know, you're going at much slower speeds, uh, therefore you're, you're maintaining uh, eye contact with other other drivers, and you quickly become accustomed to how these things work. So back to you, Chris. Okay, so now I'm gonna just walk you through kind of the engineering, traffic engineering work that Ty and Bond conducted. So, uh, you know, I'll talk you through like why Route 5 was selected for a road diet. Um, I'll just talk about how we selected this road. We went through a screening process, um, and part of it was that it was on the 2019 paving program at the time, um, but like Ken said, we're looking at the entire state for road diet implementation. Um, and so we're applying a uniform set of screening uh, process across the state. Uh, I'll talk to you about the engineering that we conducted. Um, and then I'll just show you some of the conceptual improvements. <clears throat> so we started out with a screening process where we looked at every state road that was under 22,000 uh, ADT. So that's average daily traffic. That's the total bi-directional traffic on the corridor. Uh, so every road that had less than 22,000 made it past that initial screen. Um, it had to be undivided. We wanted to have a segment length that was meaningful. Um, so it was more than a quarter mile in length so that we could actually apply a, a meaningful road diet to the corridor. Um, we looked at side street and driveway density. So when we're putting in a center turn lane, we want to have driveways and side streets to actually function with the center turn lane. Um, Parker will talk to you about the accident review and crash safety that we looked at along the corridor. Um, and then, you know, access to alternative travel modes. We wanted to see if, if the corridor was on the bike, uh, the bike, the statewide bike route program. Um, and so all of these criteria were like kind of the initial screening that we went through. So as I said, uh, Route 5 was on the VIP program. <clears throat> and from the 190 overpass to Franklin Street was the first segment. That's still a, th a three-lane segment, so that's not on the road diet program. Then you've got Franklin Street to Grant Street. Um, we've maintained that section of the roadway because of the function of traffic in that section. So then from Grant Street to University Place, uh, four-lane undivided. Uh, with average daily traffic between 10,000 and 13,400. So this corridor falls kind of right in the sweet spot of a roadway corridor that we would say would be a good candidate for a road diet. So we're below 15,000, um, and that's, you know, the published data shows us that anything below 15,000 is usually a very good candidate for implementation of a road diet. And then once you get north of University Place, uh, it converts back to a two-lane two section, and then you get into the interchange area uh, just south of the mass line. And so that section of the corridor was not uh, included. <clears throat> so the total length of the segment that's uh, a candidate is 1.6 miles. Um, the roadway width south of Brainerd is 52 feet and north of Brainerd is 42 feet. Um, the posted speed limit is 35 miles per hour. Uh, and you've got you know, your, your typical mix of land uses. You've got houses on the corridor. You've got light commercial, mixed use, institutional. Um, 
There are six traffic signals. There are 26 intersecting side streets. So that's uh, 15 side streets per mile. And you've got 121 driveways along the corridor. So each one of those locations is where turns are happening. Um, and so that's why when we think about the corridor, and like Mike said, you've got a lot of access occurring along Route 5. It's not just throughput. There's a lot of access going on on that roadway. <clears throat> you've got a continuous sidewalk along the west side of the corridor. Uh, there are crosswalks at the major signalized intersections. There are two mid-block, so unsignalized crosswalks at Park Avenue and the, and the church. <clears throat> there are currently no bicycle accommodations because of the narrowness of the existing uh, roadway shoulders. Uh, there are 13 bus stops, so you do have a transit function that occurs along Route 5, um, and you have one bus shelter uh, near Belmont that sits back away from the road. It has no sidewalks to it, no connectivity. Um, <clears throat> and so, you know, all of these things are, are what went into the process that we looked at as far as why this corridor was uh, a candidate. So this is just uh, traffic data that the state collects every three years. So starting back here uh, in 1991, and we drew that 15,000 ADT line to kind of give you a sense of how traffic has changed or you know, slightly decreased since 1991 through 2018. Um, and so your blue line is uh, just north of Elm Street, Route 220, um, and then down south of uh, 190, so just south of the project area, uh, you've got ADT that was about 12,000, and now it's about 10,000. But the majority of your, of your roadway corridor is anywhere between 12,000 uh, and 14,000, and you know, we see this, this trend line um, of traffic volumes flat to decreasing over time. So we conducted a study. Uh, we wanted to see what would happen if we actually implemented the, the road diet. Uh, how would the intersections function? Um, what would the level of service be? And that's what we call, that's what we use to determine how an intersection functions. Um, we just wanted to make sure that if we advanced the project, that we weren't going to have a negative impact on how the corridor functions. Um, and so we, we studied these uh, seven locations. Uh, we collected traffic data uh, in December of 2018 at the beginning of the month um, during the morning and the afternoon peak hours. So we looked at the two peak periods uh, of the corridor during a weekday. <clears throat> We compared existing conditions to the road diet. So we looked at what it is, how it is functioning today as it stands today, and then we analyzed it with the road diet configuration um, to determine what the operational impact would be of the, of the corridor changing from a four-lane to a three-lane section. Um, and ultimately, our results confirmed that with the types of changes we make at the intersections, adding turn lanes, um, the corridor does not really show any real degradation in capacity. So, you know, a couple of seconds in average delay uh, changes, but in general, levels of service stay the same. <clears throat> so level of service is a measurement um, where it's like school. You know, an A is a, a great level of service and an F is a failing level of service. Uh, and A's and B's are when you get to an intersection and you wait for a few seconds and you go right through the intersection, the signal changes quickly. Um, as you work down through the grades, uh, C's is where you uh, start to see a little bit of delay. Uh, as you get down through D's and E's, you start to see congestion. Um, maybe you're sitting at a signal for multiple phases where you see red, green, yellow, red, green, yellow a couple times. Um, and then F is when we get to that unacceptable level of service. <clears throat> So what this chart shows you um, is that starting here uh, down at 190 and then working our, our way north through the corridor, uh, you've got your morning and your afternoon peak hours, and then you've got your existing intersection levels of service and your, then your road diet levels of service. And so what this tells us is that 
at 190 uh, at the south end, existing as a B in the morning, with the road diet, it stays to be in the afternoon, uh, in the in the morning, and then in the afternoon, uh, sees. So the only location where we saw a slight decrease in overall intersection level of service was at uh, 220 Elm Street, where it's an existing B in the morning, and it drops down to a C in the afternoon. Um, and we do consider a level of service C still a very acceptable operations for a signalized intersection, especially at a two-state route intersection. <clears throat> so based on the engineering work we did, uh, Route 5 was seen as having a feasible corridor with minimal operational impacts. So the proposed cross-section, um, we would provide 11-foot travel lanes in each direction with a 14-foot center turn lane, so a comfortably <laughs> wide center turn lane so that you have more room in between the two directions of travel, and then eight-foot shoulders. Um, you know, what you have out there now today is anywhere from two feet to one foot, um, so you'd have those wider shoulders which can accommodate bike traffic. <clears throat> Uh, and we do have some, some changes at the, at the 220 intersection. So um, at 220, we're going to provide a northbound, uh, a left turn lane, a through lane, and a right turn lane. So when I was coming up here tonight, I was at 220, and I was in the right lane, and there was someone behind me with their right turn signal on who was stuck behind me because I was going through the intersection, and they wanted to turn right, but I was in the right side through lane uh, blocking their right turn movement. And then in the southbound direction, uh, we'll have that opposing left turn lane and then a through right turn lane uh, in the southbound direction. <clears throat> and then up at Brainerd Road, um, we're also making lane use changes there. Uh, so you'll have a northbound through left and a right turn lane to accommodate the right turn traffic, the heavy right turn movement there. Uh, and in the southbound direction, a left turn lane and a through right lane. So you have a lot of traffic coming and going from Brainerd. And so we're providing lanes to accommodate uh, that those movements at the intersection. So Parker, we'll talk to you a little bit about uh, safety along the corridor. Thanks, Chris. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Parker Sorensen, uh, one of the consultants to this on. Um, look at safety, uh, kind of led this process. Um, we, we learned a little bit before about just overall safety and concepts of safety. Uh, we're going to dive in a little bit to uh, what does this corridor look like specifically. Um, over the three-year period between 2015 and 2017, uh, we saw a total of 104 crashes. Um, of course, not all these crashes uh, can be mitigated uh, and reduced by implementing a road diet. Uh, so we looked at what we called target crashes, uh, really went through an evaluation process based on federal highway guidelines to, to analyze those crashes, which we think can be reduced um, by implementing a, a um, road diet. In general, about 60% of all crashes, or 62 uh, crashes in that three-year period, were identified as being target crashes. Um, we talked about this. We went through a defined process based on federal highway research, looking at side swipes, um, rear end accidents and crashes in segments and that sort of thing. In general, Mike talked about how some of the previous research is looking at how injuries reduced as a greater proportion than all crashes. So we saw a greater reduction in injury crashes than general crashes. Um, so this table is a little hard to see on this screen. Uh, generally shows uh, crashes from left to right in order of severity. So crash that ended up resulting in a fatality to uh, your three uh, orders the severity of in injury and a crash that might just be a fender bender and cause property damage. In general, we had our target crashes in the bottom there. We saw a range in injury crashes as a proportion of total crashes anywhere from 60 to 100 percent. So our target crashes represent uh, about 60 to 100 percent of injury crashes of all from the all crashes data set. Um, and I think that's important because uh, we're looking at a lot of angle collisions um, and collisions that tend to cause um, injury. And I'll show you kind of an example how that plays out. So a map showing all crashes throughout the corridor, all 100 or so crashes. Um, you'll see that the six intersections are identified here. What we did is we removed that to the target crashes. 
Uh, so we see a generally consistent amount of crashes throughout the corridor. Um, two areas to note. Uh, area to the left here um, would be in the southern part, uh, south of 220. And then also uh, to the north part of this corridor uh, near Montana Road. So we kind of have two little clusters. Uh, and we'll take a look at kind of what the police diagrams show, uh, just so you have an example of what's happening out there. So we'll take a look at here. So this is Montana Road near Duncan. Uh, stop and save, there's a small grocery there. Um, there's about a dozen or so crashes uh, to the south of Montana Road. And I just pulled three, so the police, uh, we have a very good crash data uh, in this state, uh, electronically uploaded directly from the police departments. Uh, here are three of the crash diagrams that the, the police um, made up here for three of these collisions. Um, yeah, can you get the next one here when I'm ready? Uh, first one here is you got this orange car. Uh, what's happening? Uh, vehicle waiting to turn left into this uh, stop and save, uh, rear end collision uh, to that vehicle. The next one's similar, similar crash. Uh, vehicle waiting here, another rear end. And then this is very similar, kind of the opposite of the video we saw earlier. Uh, vehicle exiting uh, stop and save, uh, where one vehicle in the right lane is yielding to let that vehicle go. The, the vehicle on the inside does not see that vehicle come out and uh, T-bones uh, that vehicle exiting that driveway. And then beyond the crash data, it's important to note that you know, the data that I present here, it's only reportable crash incidents. We know driving every day that there's uh, near miss collisions and, and things that happen um, that don't get reported. There, you know, there's no damage, there's no police report. That's obviously not in the, the crash uh, report. Um, you know, also just frustration in general, you know, anxiety driving is, is very important in livability. I, did, I thought our projector was gonna be bigger, but I pulled this. This was a, actually on the Enfield uh, CT open forum. I found this today. Um, so I'll just read it. And the, the picture here, all you see is a car. <laughs> and it just says, uh, June 12, 2019, 8.07 AM. A vehicle traveling southbound on Route 5 went around and passed my son's stop bus with red lights flashing and the stop sign extended. Bus driver had just finished laying on the horn as I started the video. And he goes on to say, this is vehicle number 22 this year that has passed my son's stop bus as he's either getting on the bus or exiting the bus. Um, so I don't know where this was on Route 5, uh, but I think it's important to note that incidents like these happen every day. Um, this is a residential corridor surrounding Route 5. Uh, school buses, I know, are active up and down the corridor, and I'm sure I was a school kid once, you know. Uh, getting, stopping three other lanes of traffic as a school bus driver is pretty challenging. So uh, another thought for you there. We're almost done, uh, so I just want to show you kind of what the concepts are and what's shown on the map up here in front. So uh, we'll start down uh, at the southern end. So here we are at, here's Route 190, the Route 90 uh, exit ramp to Route 5 down by Franklin. <clears throat> So in that section, uh, you see that we're still providing a southbound right turn lane uh, and a northbound left turn lane into uh, Franklin, I mean into Grant, and then from the at point north is where the road diet starts, and that's where you see the center left turn lane uh, on the right side of that plan. Sure. <clears throat> so here's where the road diet starts, and, and you've got driveways on this side and a, and a side street here. So that's why we start the road diet here. Uh, but as you come north, you have the left turn lane to go to Grant, and you've got the right turn lane to go to Franklin based on the traffic volumes. <clears throat> so here's the Route 220 Elm Street area. Um, so currently today, you've got three through lanes, or three lanes of traffic in both directions, opposing lefts, and then two through lanes in each direction. Uh, under the road diet, the center turn lane comes up and terminates into a left turn lane. Uh, we then have the one through lane and then an exclusive right turn lane to process the traffic that wants to turn right at Elm Street. Um, and so based on the volumes, 
we see that heavy volume of traffic that wants to turn right, and now we're giving them their exclusive turn lane to do that. And then the southbound direction, the left turn lanes line up, and then we're processing the southbound traffic in a single through lane with the wider shoulders. <coughs> and then up at Brainerd Road, uh, towards the north end of the section, um, again, two lanes in each direction through this section. Under the proposed condition, we provide a left turn pocket into uh, Colony Road, and then we carry the through lane through the intersection, and we provide an exclusive right turn lane to process the traffic that's uh, orientated to Brainerd Road. And conversely, in the southbound direction, we have a left turn lane and a through lane before we restart that road diet section just to the north of there. <coughs> As I said, here's the typical section, eight foot shoulders, 11 foot lanes, and a 14 foot center turn lane as the typical section. So the next steps in the process um, after the meeting tonight, um, you know, we'll be looking for uh, feedback from the town. Um, the department will be moving forward with their pavement rehabilitation project once funding is available. Um, and if the project is endorsed by the town, uh, Time Bond will work with the state to kind of finalize the, the layout of the pavement markings. Um, and then once the paving is done, the road diet will get implemented as part of the restriping process, um, along with some traffic signal adjustments to accommodate the new lane configurations. So that concludes our formal presentation. Uh, I think that uh, Mayor wanted to take over and just kind of facilitate. So we're here to kind of field questions, and hopefully we have uh, answers for you as you go through the process. Thank you. Thank you. And what we'll do is try to be very orderly to make sure everyone gets a chance to speak. I'll just raise your hand, and I will select you, and Mr. Comey will give you the, the mic. And just real quick on some of the process, how this is, where how we've gotten to this point. So the state was talking through our traffic division. You know, and we had a subcommittee meeting for the, the public safety with, with the Chief Fox, who's here, and Captain Kazalowski, Councillor Denny, and Councillor Bosco, and myself are part of that committee. The question was, would we like to see a public hearing if this was going to be implemented? Of course, the answer was yes. That's why we're here tonight. So I just want to make sure people understand that the state approached the town. The town agreed that that's why they're here, to, to show, show you the ideas. So that's why we had the public hearing. And unless we're misinterpreting how this is going to work, we, the council eventually would have to endorse this, so meaning we'd have to get a 6-5 vote of the town council to make it move forward. So, this, so that's just sort of the process for, for everyone to know. And so again, this is a really an informational hearing. I mean, you folks have been patient, so thank you, doing a great job. Just want to let you know we wanted to make sure that you had, you had a chance to see this before the council even starts to even consider if we would even, you know, to consider this. So that's how the processes work. And again, sorry, real quick, and I'll we'll turn it over. Councilor Denny's here, Deputy Mayor Suzak's here, Board of Ed Chairman Mr. Krizel is here, and of course, Mr. our state rep, Mr. Arnone. So again, represented from the town and the state. And that's it, I'm done talking. We first hand Dave. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. And I'd like to say that I can see that you're trying to make the roads a lot safer here in Enfield. But when I first started driving, I got the driver's manual from the Department of Motor Vehicles. And that book is very important. And I don't think they pass that book out anymore to new drivers or even old drivers. When you go to renew your license, you should be given one of the driver manuals and wrote, learn road courtesy, safety, operations of the vehicle. And when I first started riding the bicycle, we were told, don't ride in the road and you ride on a sidewalk. Maybe they say you don't think riding on a sidewalk. When you're riding a bicycle on a sidewalk, you get off the bicycle when a pedestrian is walking by, and you courteously wait let to them walk by, and then you get back on your bicycle and you ride again. You don't ride a bicycle on a sidewalk, on a road. It's too dangerous. You wouldn't let your little kids ride a bicycle in the road. It's too dangerous. Now you're gonna put, a, supposedly, a bicycle lane in the road. That's dangerous. I wouldn't ride a bicycle in the, in the road. It's dangerous enough to walk across the road. Pedestrians don't know road courtesy, common courtesy for themselves and for other people. That's the problem with the world today. You gotta be careful out there. 
When you're driving a car, you you know, observe where you're traveling from, where you're going to. Don't have so many things in your mind. No text messaging. All of that is considered. But these manuals very important. When you pass them out, I don't know if you guys with the Department of Motor Vehicles or, or the Department of Transportation. I'll get to that later on. The Department of Transportation. I don't take too much time. I know there's other people who want to speak also. But I'm wondering how much money is this going to cost our town? It's going to cost our state. Then we're going to have to put tolls in place. We're going to put tolls on this year later around 25 years from now just to travel on our Enfield Street. Common sense is all it takes. Be careful on the roads. Someone's going to make a left-hand turn. You make a left-hand turn, you'll be observant. I know people don't do that, and that's why you have so many crashes that uh, uh, happening here on, on, on this section of the road. Of course, other roads. Common curves, you all the time be aware of what you're doing. People don't do that. I'm worried about the cost of all of this, and you're going to spend $2.5 million on this? Drive around through the town and see the rest of the roads, the potholes we have, the unfinished roads on Hazard Avenue, just by ta tractor supply there. There's potholes in those are deep deep fissures in the ground. They dig a hole. They don't compact it down in layers. They just fill a hole and compact the top. Then it all sinks in later on. Same thing with that on Fairfield Road. They dig for the water pipe. I don't want to get on now when I was. Well, you want just a question for this. Okay, the question for this is. We got a lot of people want to speak. So is, was, how much is this going to cost the town besides the $2.5 million in overtime? And is it going to require having tolls on our roads? We won't have our neighbors coming from Massachusetts shopping here. We've lost too much industry already. Okay, I'll keep it short. Thank you all for being here, and God bless America. I don't know if you have an estimate on cost. Yeah, go ahead. The, uh, the cost to repave the road yes. beginning at uh, Route 190 Hazard Avenue yes. going all the way up to uh, Massachusetts uh, border is $1.5 million. That's a regularly scheduled paving program. Uh, it's because the road needs to be repaved sure. because of the condition. Uh, implementing the road pavement markings would be no additional cost because you're going to be repaving painting in any way, yes. so there would be a, no additional cost to implement these uh, these markings. If that so answers your question. Somewhere the money's going to come from, no. The $1.5 million uh, is allocated uh, Taxes. from, uh, it's all state state state, state, state funds, federal, state or it's state funds, and it's uh, part of the, re uh, you know, the regularly scheduled paving project. It was tentatively scheduled uh, to be repaved this construction season. However, um, we're waiting for available funds. They're, the funds aren't available at this time. They could become available later in the year or next year. So at this time, there is no okay. definitive okay. schedule uh, to repave uh, the road at, at this time. But like I said, when funds become available, uh, it will uh, be scheduled. You're with the Department of Transportation? Yes, I am. Oh, good. Vicky, um, sorry, Dave. Vicky's turn. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick questions. When you did your traffic counts, you just did them once in December of 2018. Is that right? Yes, we counted uh, one typical weekday. Okay, and the slide you had up there with the number of accidents, I saw there were, it went by fast, but there were zero fatalities, one serious accident, I think. And were there any, I couldn't read fast enough, were there any involving pedestrians or bicyclists? And no pedestrians. Yeah, so no pedestrians. Two, two cyclists. Um, you know, in the, the order of injuries, there was 34 crashes involving injuries. Uh, and I will note that a single crash could cause multiple injuries if you had four people in a car. So there could be more 34 or more injuries. Um, out of those 34 crashes. Okay, and last question. When you're picking the town or roads to do this, do you look at the number of pedestrians and bicyclists that normally use that route? Because I don't, I don't have an opinion. I'm not expressing an opinion. It's just a question. I don't see a lot of pedestrians or bicyclists on this section of Route 5. So I'm wondering if that's one of the things you look at. So part of the issue is that the roadway, as it's currently configured, is not really accommodating for cyclists. So they're not going to be there because there's not safe room for them to ride their bikes in the shoulders. Um, but as far as how did we pick the road, um, like I said at the beginning, this is part of a statewide That's safety fine. program, and it was in the 2019 paving program, which is why we're here in 2019 to look at this segment. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Deb, then I got George, and then I got Chair. Okay. You mentioned something about 
bus stops, which we don't have except our own little local Enfield busing route. We do not have state buses that come in and take people from A to, to B except for the commuter parking lot. We do? Yeah. Where? I've never, I've lived. There's one down where Stoke Shop is. There's one by St. Patrick's Church. They cook, yeah. they cook okay, right. because in the 26 years I've lived in Enfield, I've never seen a bus. I have. Early morning, Route 5, the mass bus goes up there and down. Okay, I'm sorry. I've never seen it, but. So there are 13 signed bus stops on the corridor, uh, and it serves CT Transit Route 905 and the Enfield Yellow Line. Okay. So there's. But my real thing is I'm really concerned about the new traffic pattern on Route 5. Route 5 is very heavily traveled in those areas. I have problems getting out, going the opposite direction. If I'm at, okay, just give an example, let's stop and save. If I'm going home, I have to go southbound. There's nightmares trying to get through for traffic with trying to get through. But if you congest it down to one lane of traffic, that's going to be double the amount of cars that I'm going to have to weave through to get over. Then, with this bus stop, that little incident that you guys were talking about, what's going to stop it when you do it on the road diet? People are going to go in the turn-only lane and fly right around the bus. They fly around the buses on my street, which is a very rural street here in town. It's two lanes. People are going to want to run around them. They are. Good happening. George, the chairman. You're right. Or, uh, George is for that chairman. Good evening. I sent you about nine questions, but I'll, I'll just try to reduce three of them here. Uh, I don't know, have you been on Route 5 while the school buses are traveling, no. making frequent stops to let children embark and disembark the bus? Cars will be unable to ever pass these buses, and I consider this a hazard to our children. When tolls come to Route 91, then this will cause even more traffic problems to and from the Massachusetts line to avoid Route 91. When the casino is completed in the next couple of years and Route 91 is a toll road, we'll have another increase in traffic to and from the casino in East Windsor, in and out of Massachusetts. And ADT, I don't think your 13,000 cars is going to cover that. You should probably be up to 17 or 18,000 into the next category. But you didn't cover that at all. So I'll stop at this point. So the, so the question well, is, whether, would, whether, yeah, whether uh, such diversions are going to occur as a result of the tolls and to what degree, it's, it's unknown. Um, I, I, my office was not inv is not involved in the toll study, but it's my understanding that the proposed spacing of the toll gantries is anticipated to help uh, minimize diversions to local roads. Um, it's my understanding, again, again, I'm, I'm not involved in the tolls. Um, it's my understanding that they're spaced every six miles. So for someone to divert off the highway to, uh, to bypass one toll booth and travel two miles on a local road that has traffic signals, to me, it, it doesn't seem highly likely. What, would I do it to save 35 cents? I, I, I probably wouldn't. I, I don't know if anyone else, but I can only speak for myself. Uh, and uh, as Chris uh, had indicated during his presentation regarding the, level, the traffic levels of service at each of the, uh, the signalized intersections, we're at Bs, As, and Bs, so there's plenty of reserve capacity to accommodate any future diversions or casino traffic. So. There, there is plenty of reserve capacity to accommodate that traffic if, if it ever is, um, you know, materialized. Hi. Oh, this one? Um, I'm going to give a little bit of a different perspective. I'm in highly in favor of this uh, proposal. 
I am a cyclist. Uh, I will not ride on Route 5 beyond the 190 uh, uh, on-ramp um, because, as you've mentioned, the um, shoulders in that area range from one foot to two foot. There's a lot of debris in that area. The pavement conditions are abysmal. Um, but I will say also that um, this section that is proposed to be redeveloped in this manner, it connects uh, fragmented neighborhoods um, that are not connected for multimodal transportation options at this time. This would give an opportunity, eight feet of, of um, shoulder would be amazing for pedestrians, runners like myself, cyclists like myself. It would connect parts of the community that are currently fragmented and it would be in line with Enfield's future uh, development, economic development plan in the center of town. And you only have to look at Collinsville or West Hartford to know that bicycle transportation does bring economic development in a positive manner. It's extremely important to, to focus on that at this point. It's becoming more and more popular. Um, it's becoming more and more economic. Um, and I, I do believe that this would be a positive impact to our community. Not only that, those fragmented areas that are being affected by this proposal, um, there are a lot of children in that area. Currently, those children are riding on sidewalks, and that is extremely, um, under the, the current configuration, dangerous. Um, I don't know if those bicyclist accidents that were reflected in the report were just solely on the road or also included on sidewalks. But the problem with riding on sidewalks with bicycles is that drivers who are pulling in and out of driveways are not paying attention to the sidewalk necessarily. They're paying attention to the road. And if you put the, the bicyclists on the shoulders as opposed to the sidewalk, we are far safer than if we were riding on the sidewalks. Um, this, this is a significant improvement to the traffic pattern. It will result in significant economic development in town. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, sorry, call me. <clears throat> Jim LaFountain. I live at uh, 58 Elm Street, Route 220. A lot of accidents on 91. First thing they do, they divert all the traffic onto Elm Street. They come down Route 5. Now, restricting the route, I'm not in favor of it because now you're going to have traffic in the bicycle lanes traveling down those the road especially in the morning when there's accidents on 91, and there's quite a few accidents happen on 91 lately. So I, I think it'd be best to leave the two, two lanes the way it is. That's my opinion. Thank you, sir. Marie, sorry. Hi, I, you know, I understand that road diet is good for certain areas. I don't believe that Enfield is one of those areas. The place that you were talking about, the stop and shop or sh the that little store there, there, there's, there. yeah, that's it. There's a light. I go there often for the vegetable store. I go out with the light. If you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you go out with the light. If you go to the plaza up above, you go out with the light. The major intersections on Route 5 have a light. So there's no reason to pull out into traffic. You go to a light, and you wait for it to turn green, and you go. I've lived here my whole life. You're talking about 1.6 miles. That's not going to make a dent. I think we're just looking to spend money where we don't need to spend it. There's far worse. If you want to go and change something, go look at Hazard Avenue or Elm Street. I mean, you want to talk accidents, I'd like to see the, statistic, the statistics from those streets. Route 5 is a heavily, it's a road that's heavily used. Like this gentleman said, if there's an accident on 91, Route 5 plugs up. When the Big E comes to town, Route 5 plugs up. By doing this, you're going to cause more accidents because you're going to put people in an unfamiliar road. So I understand the cyclist. I understand the jogger. I do. But I honestly think in that one little point six, 
there's plenty of turning areas with lights that you can go in and out of intersections. I believe Chris had indicated that there were how many over a over a hundred driveways uh, along that corridor. You're talking about six. We have over 100 more driveways that don't have the benefit of, uh, of a traffic signal. So, Because you're looking at taking a left into a driveway when somebody else is going to take a right. So I, I don't see how that center lane is going to help a driveway situation. It, it provides him a place to harbor, to store outside the, the through traffic. He doesn't have that person behind him breathing down his neck beeping his horn, waiting to turn, and he would only have to tr uh, cross one lane of traffic as opposed to two. Uh, they, they showed the, uh, the crash uh, um, diagram regarding where the first vehicle lets you go, but the other car didn't, and, and, and that creates a T-bone uh, uh, scenario. So um, we're, th those are the type of crashes that we're trying to uh, uh, you know, address. I just have one thing to say. So just, you know, I don't, we're not, making up information here tonight. So when we started out the presentation, we talked a lot about different areas across the country where accident severity and accident numbers went down. So it's not, it's, there's data out there that tells us that taking a four lane road and reducing it to a three lane road with a center turn lane provides a safety benefit. Now, you can choose to believe that information that we gave or not. Uh, I mean, that's that's purely up to you. And and we gave you a lot of information here tonight. And there's a lot more information. Uh, if you go to Federal Highway Administration's website, there's oodles and oodles of information on the benefits of road diets. So we're presenting data from other places in the country that have roadways with similar volumes of traffic that have shown safety benefits. Now. I think we can all agree that if you're on a four-lane roadway and you have to cross two lanes of traffic and you're in your inside turn lane, you're now dealing with trying to determine the gap in traffic on two lanes and how fast is the guy in the outside lane going versus the, the person in the inside lane. So you have to process two cars coming at you versus moving into a center turn lane and processing one car coming at you and then choosing the gap in traffic. And then secondly, you know, we did analyze the intersections to make sure that if the corridor showed that we were going to have a significant impact on intersection capacity, we wouldn't be here tonight recommending this. But the study shows that based on the volume that's out there today, and you may have more volume in the future, but on the volume that's out there today, the intersections operate at B's and C's. And there are plenty of other corridors across the state that function as two-lane roadways with 13,000 ADT, just like the section of Route 5 south of 190 that's two lanes in each direction that has about 11,000 ADT. So you have a corridor in town that's just south of 190 that's two lanes. It doesn't have the center turn lane benefit, but it doesn't have the density of driveways and the commercial uses that you have in this section. So providing that center turn lane provides that safe refuge for people that want to turn in and out of driveways. And it's not just turning into the driveways. So if you want to come out of traffic and get into traffic, you can pull out into the center turn lane and then wait for a gap to get into the lane that you want to go to. So that center turn lane provides benefits of both turning in and, and exiting out. Um, and we've seen these provide benefits across the state of Connecticut. I understand it's unfamiliar. Um, and, you know, I think if, if we were standing here tonight and saying that we wanted to take a two-lane Enfield Street and widen it to four lanes, then we would hear that you're going to turn the road into a speedway and traffic volumes are going to go up. And <coughs> <laughs> I just know that by doing this, I, I, I always hear both sides of that equation where we, we try to improve a roadway and we hear that we're going to increase travel speed. So... You know, it's. <coughs> so, so we're trying to just give you the information to make an informed decision on this proposal, and that's why we're here tonight, and that's why we've tried to present safety information. We've given you information from a federal highway. We've given you results of a study. Um, so. Um, I'm a school bus driver. These are my fellow drivers here. I don't know if you're aware, on that stretch of Route 5, approximately every day, morning, noon, 
in late in the afternoon, there's that better, in the afternoon, approximately 20 buses will go back and forth. Wow, buses, right. vans, first student buses, all the out of town buses run that road. If we are in a single lane, we leave the high school at two o'clock, there's at least eight of us that have to come down here. We're gonna be in a single lane and some of us have to stop along Route 5, okay? Not only when we make a stop, we also have to adjust ourselves to the right side of the road, which leaves people to go around us. As it is now, it's very stressful for us. We get honked at, we get flipped off, we get cut off, we get tailgated. A lot of things happen to us. I feel the people need an out to go around us so they're not stuck behind us. We need to go around each other. You sit, called it, you said you didn't want to use the word delay. We will be very delayed getting our children home, getting to our other schools. In the morning, parents have to go to work. They are timed by the time we get to their homes. Okay, we're gonna be making people late, and I don't think it's fair to all these people to have to sit and wait behind a line of eight school buses to get to where they're going. I don't know if you considered how many school buses there are in this town, and when they consolidated the high school, everyone on the north of Enfield has to travel to the south end of Enfield for the high school. So, with uh, no traffic light at the high school. <coughs> no traffic light at the high school. Yeah, yeah. Sutton, put a traffic light there. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Charlie, right in front of you. Charlie, Scott, and then we're on that side. <laughs> then I got all, we're on that side. Sorry. Charlie, Scott, then we go on that side. Charlie. Well. One of the factors that you don't seem to mention is uh, we have Massachusetts drivers here. They don't drive like Connecticut drivers do. <laughs> and as you are a lot, everybody or a lot of people know, a third lane is called the suicide lane. They've been a suicide lane for 50 years. That's why we don't have them. And when it snows, you can't tell where the lanes are. And those Massachusetts people, they don't care where the lanes are anyway. So, plus the, the good point that was made about the accidents on 91. We have a lot of them down the end. And they come right over to five and they crowd Route 5. I applaud your effort to look ahead as to the markings and things like that. But there's a lot of other things that you have to be concerned about. I'll give you one. I'm 25 years in the military. One of the things I look at in my local area is, what can a terrorist do? He looks for bottlenecks, how to cause them, and use them to his advantage. The first thing I would do is blow up that bridge going across uh, the river. What's going to happen to Route 5 then? There's a lot of things that can happen that you're, you, I know on a day-to-day -day basis you can't consider. But these are some that you have to look forward to. Exactly. Now, Massachusetts drivers, they don't seem to mind to drive and talk on the phone at the same time. That's not our police's fault. It's just the way they do things up there. It's just so you're, you're going to add a lot of confusion with this third lane. And uh, there are a lot of places that we could use that turnarounds into main uh, avenues where the uh, houses are, but not on a, a main road like five. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. Charlie, right in front of Scott. Scott, right here. And then I get, we got that side next. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank our local elected officials for providing us this opportunity with DOT to be heard tonight. Um, who knows the area better than the people who actually live here? Um, so, and also thank you to all you who came out tonight because um, hopefully they'll, they'll listen to us. So the, my first thing is that uh, one of the, several people have mentioned Interstate 91. How much thought was given to the fact that this road does parallel Interstate 91? And I know from firsthand experience, it does not take much for uh, beyond a, even a minor incident on 91 to cause problems on Route 5, uh, especially the corridor where we're talking about from the state line down. Uh, the bus drivers, you, you nailed it. Uh, thanks for bringing that one up. 
Uh, as far as the state's uh, long-term transportation plans, I kind of breezed through that today. It talks heavily about congestion and dealing with congestion, uh, pollution from vehicles going slower, increased collisions um, from stop and go type of traffic that you'll have with that. Uh, some consideration needs to be given to that. I get the complete streets part of it. I participated in the process. I provided comments. There's plenty of low-hanging fruit here in town, like DOT's failure to put a crosswalk at Palumba in 220 when you put the new lights up a few years back, where you've got other opportunities for people in pedestrian traffic there. Um, and I get it as well, because I also bike, and I bike that stretch. It's, it is a little treacherous. I just have to avoid it. I understand that's a compromise we have to make. Lastly, the center turn lane. Suicide lane nails it. Um, people are unfamiliar with it in this area. Uh, you've got a graphic here that also concerns me showing an emergency vehicle, saying how it's going to be easier to travel down that center lane. What happens when you get a locking left when you're driving a fire truck? Uh, I drive. I drive fire trucks. Uh, that really concerns me. I understand you have a lot of data uh, from other uh, studies and case studies across the country, but every community is unique and every section is unique. I strongly don't feel that it's appropriate for this stretch of road. Thank you again for the opportunity. I want to get to everyone who has spoke first, then I'll get to the folks who have already spoken. So I apologize. Just want to get everyone a chance first. Go ahead, sir. Sorry. I find uh, your presentation rather interesting. Uh, you talked about studies done in Indianapolis, Reno, Nevada, uh, Chicago, Orlando, Florida, but you never went up to uh, East Long Meadow, Massachusetts, did you? It's just up the road a little ways. They have this on Shaker Road, and to a uh, to a merchant, it's a nightmare. They don't like it. It causes confusion. This is, I went into three businesses. Uh, there's a bowling alley up there. It's been there for God knows how long. It hasn't helped their business. Uh, there's Acres Power Equipment. They've been there longer. I talked to the owner. Doesn't like it. It causes confusion. His trucks try to get out in the morning, and they can't because that center lane is also a travel lane. People get in it. Uh, there's a change of shift at uh, Milton Bradley, and people get in that, tra in that uh, center lane, and uh, his trucks can't get out. So he doesn't like it. The bank doesn't like it. Now, I asked, what would they rather have? Well, they said anything. Uh, stop lights, traffic lights, okay? Uh, turn signals, uh, where the, like you have uh, right now on Route 5, where you have a lane dedicated for a left hand turn. Uh, you know, anything would be better than that center lane, that left turn lane. So, uh, I also asked, I asked every one of them, has this increased your business? No. Nobody can say it's, it's helping the economy of any place, of anybody. So I don't know where you got your, your information, but I wish you would have got something locally. Now, Route 5 is the access road to East Windsor for emergency vehicles. The chief of police can verify this. If there's a need for an infield police uh, officer in East Windsor, they go down Route 5. If the ambulance has to go down Route 5 to get down to East Windsor, and vice versa. If there's a, an incident in East Windsor and they have to go to a Springfield hospital or Johnson, they come up Route 5. So I don't know what you're really trying to prove here, but you didn't do anything locally. And from what I have seen, there's been one person here who's spoken in favor. Everybody else has spoken against this. I would think that would be enough for you to shut down this and leave things as they are. Thank you. I just wanted to, uh, I know you mentioned that uh, where else this hasn't been done locally. We just, uh, we did uh, a road diet on Route 44, uh, Burnside Avenue in, in East Hartford. That's been, uh, a, it's been a great success. So I, 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 don't, I don't want you to think that this is the first and only road diet in Connecticut. It's been, 
It's been done, and it's been done successfully, and it's been done successfully throughout the country. So this isn't something that we're just trying. It's, it's proven to be uh, safe throughout the country. Go ahead, sir. One other thing. Yes, in this also, uh, you have the same situation in Ithaca, New York. All right, and it works there. But it does, it's not, Ithaca is not infield. East Hartford is not infield. You have to take this into consideration. Sir, sorry, sorry. Thanks for your opinion. Um, so I travel Route 5 either direction uh, to work and also to the firehouse. Um, I, when it goes down to a single lane, I'm in my personal vehicle trying to get to the firehouse to help somebody else. And I got a slow driver, and I'm going the speed limit, but they're going 10, 15 miles an hour. That delays us um, getting to the fire. Um, and then so I travel. There's sometimes I'm up that road five, six times a day. Uh, depending on what the call volume is, so. Thank you. Thank you for being patient, ma'am. I mean, you've been great. Sorry, you're next. Then Donna, and then, sorry, go ahead. Hi, Janet LaFountain, 58 Elm Street. Okay, I was going to bring up the emergency vehicles because I think that's utmost important to all all of us, and I've heard two other people bring it up, but I haven't heard anybody address what's the protocol for the drivers for the people on bikes, for the pedestrians. Vehicle, the um, emergency vehicles should have the right of way, but what's the protocol? You haven't gone over that. Do we go into the, the emergency? The protocol is you, you, you see and hear those sirens, you pull over and let the- So you the, pull over into the bike lane, or do you pull into the suicide lane? You would pull over to the right to allow the, the, the emergency vehicle to get to get by. Okay. And that em, I, I emergency that vehicle could use the, uh, the, the, the middle left turn lane with if necessary. The amount of traffic we have with one, going down to one lane, I find that more dangerous. Now you have, you're, now you're pulling into the bike lane, and you can't pull into the suicide lane, and I think people are going to get really confused when the emergency vehicles come through. Uh, that's how I feel. And they're not easy to stop. We have an 82,000-pound truck, so yeah. it doesn't stop on dime. It takes 10, 15 feet mm -hmm. for the thing to stop. So. For sure. Well, I'm mostly here to listen, but I do have a few questions. I guess. How do you prevent that center lane from being a travel lane? And I guess, how are you gonna have markings on an eight foot wide lane that's going to dedicate that lane to bikers, to pedestrians, to whoever, and it not become a place where people either park their car or they use it as a lane? I mean, people, when you get out there and you drive, they, <laughs> they just, do some unusual things. But I guess for me, I actually grew up with that part of Route 5 was just two lanes. Yeah, to, to answer your question two regarding travel the, lanes. The, the, the designation of the middle left turn lane, it would be signed and marked accordingly. There would be numerous signs and, and right, paper markings. Right, but how do you enforce signs and marked accordingly? Uh, I guess that would be up to the local police department uh, to enforce the, uh, the lane control. Um, your other question, uh, the shoulder width, uh, it, it, uh, it's it, really not anything, a shoulder anything, at that uh, point. anything less than eight feet wide is, is typically not conceived as a through lane. So if, if it's marked as eight feet, cars aren't going to go in there to drive it. And it's going to be marked with a solid white line. And you know, if you're adjacent to a solid white line, you shouldn't be in it. Correct. So but it's, it's just, just you know just general rules of the road and the pavement open, markings and signs. I I would really love to see a bike lane and and that, but I don't know if this is the way to achieve what you're you're looking for. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak who hasn't spoke yet? Okay, sir. Before we get the second round, and ma'am. Yep. I just have one question. When the snowplow drivers are clearing the center lane, and a car is coming the other direction. <laughs> you know, in, in, in a normal snow plowing thing, we start from the center line, we move to the edges. <coughs> Under this circumstance, if people were using that center lane, I mean, the snow plow is going to see them, but, you know, people aren't going to be able to see, the, they're not going to be able to see the delineation until the snow is moved. You know, how do we know that they're not going to have a problem with that? That's my only question. Wait for him to go by. I would wait. 
I'm talking about people coming the other direction. That's what I'm talking about, too. You're, you're not going to get into the middle left turn lane with a big snow plow coming down. After no, you're not. But I, all I'm saying is that without the snow being removed yet, people won't know exactly where that is. Well, that's true for any road. Um, I know it is. That's what I'm saying. You know, you can't see the, the, the arrows. I've seen it, you know, I've been down south. I see the way they do it down south. It works quite well. But I'm concerned about the storm times, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. They have a different weather pattern, too. I know people have already talked about the school buses, and I'm concerned about getting <coughs> stuck behind one. But we also have trash pickup. And trash pickup on Route 5 is every house. You get stuck behind one of those garbage trucks, you're going to try to go. And uh, you would do, <laughs> what, do you, what do you do today when uh, you're traveling on a two-lane roadway with a, uh, with a uh, garbage truck? Well, we have two lanes. So no, no, no. On a regular two-lane roadway, when you encounter a, uh, a... I will wait for the traffic and go around them. Exactly. That, and I'm that's exactly what you'll do. You'll, you'll bypass him if it's safe to do so. If you see no traffic oncoming at you, you would simply <laughs> oh, I, go around. I will use exactly that. Exactly what you would do when so you're bi trying to as bypass as a, uh, a mailman or a... Or a um, a oil delivery truck. You're gonna you're gonna look to see if there's any traffic coming at you, and if there isn't, you'll safely go around him. Okay. So it, it would be no different than a, right. a normal two-lane roadway. And plus, there's there there will be an eight-foot shoulder that would in, be introduced. So he would be in that shoulder. So you wouldn't you wouldn't necessarily need to go all the way into the left turn lane because that garbage be truck is. Lane? Uh, to true. How, how is he going to get the garbage uh, tr well, uh, that's cans? What I mean. Now we've got a bike lane and we've got the buses it's, and we've got the garbage it, trucks. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 the lane will be a, uh, it's not going to be marked as a bike lane. It's going to be a wide shoulder to accommodate bicyclists and pedestrians. Uh -huh. So, okay. Oh, now, I live I'm, at the state line. I live right at the state line, and I cannot tell you. I listened to the crashes on Route 5, um, I mean on 91, and my husband and I say, get out now, because they're going to take them off onto Route 5, and I'm right at that intersection. I'm never going to get out of my street. You have no idea what this is going to do to this town. None. Oh, Steve. Yeah. Then Steve, sorry. People, people who still haven't spoken first okay. don't get second round. Sorry, gotta give everyone a chance to speak. Yeah. Hi, I, I drive a school bus in Enfield too, and um, like when we're stopping at our stops on Enfield Street, um, people are gonna try and go into that middle lane to get around us. I think it's gonna cause a lot of accidents. Especially when they see us stopping at all our, you know, at all the at all the streets that we stop at, well, we are a pain. I'm sorry, everybody. We are a pain, but it, it, it will be. I can see them now. They're going to try and, oh, we're going to try and get it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> Steve, right here. Steve. <laughs> Um, I, uh, uh, my name is Steve Mitchell. I live right off Brainerd Road, and uh, I was carefully saying I was not going to speak tonight and, um, uh, because I actually know most of these people because unlike many of the folks in this room, I happen to be a traffic engineer. I, I do this for a living. And um, I have studied many, many roads in 80 communities throughout Connecticut, not in East Longmeadow, not in Nebraska, not in somewhere else. Uh, by and large, it, it's a pretty simple reason that these work well. If you have a four-lane road on, on Route 5 today, now compare, just think in your mind of Route 5 up at the north end where it's four lanes and down toward the south end where it's two lanes, okay? And the difference 
the traffic doesn't flow better or worse really in either spot. But what the, the difference is is that when you have someone trying to make a left turn and they're doing it from a through lane, they're in everyone's way. They're in everyone's way. And the left lane is usually where people are moving faster than the curb lane. So they come upon someone sitting there momentarily, and they're not there very long, but it always seems to be the wrong minute. And that's why you have an awful lot of crashes on this piece of road, okay? And when you're waiting there to make a left, as I do a lot, because I live on Brainerd Road, pulling into cars or any, any of the local places, you have to pull across two lanes of traffic. It's a wider distance to cross. You have two lanes coming toward you. You have to s judge between two gaps to fit through. It is statistically much more dangerous. Uh, traffic engineers are not a very imaginative group of people. We simply look at facts. We look at statistics that have been gathered, and we say, hey, this works over and over again. And so when you have a left turn lane, you pull into that left turn lane, you're now only cr crossing one lane of traffic. It's a shorter distance to cross. There are fewer cars coming toward you to find gaps in because they're all in a single spot. And you're not in the way of the guy who's behind you coming down the road too fast and, and about to rear end you. So you're not looking in the rear view mirror to see if you're going to get clobbered. Nothing's perfect. Okay, there are always small issues. There's issues of snow, there's issues of plows, there's issues of the school buses, but stuck behind a school bus in one lane versus stuck behind a school bus in two lanes really isn't any difference because you can't pass them anyhow. When they start moving, but they, yeah, but, but, and in this one, and in this one stretch of road, I guess that is probably for those two hours, you know, that hour in the afternoon and the hour in the morning, that's probably actually a, be a, a disbenefit. It is a disbenefit. Of course, I'm on Brainerd Road. I sit behind a bus for two and a half miles going down Brainerd Road. Well, he makes 73 stops, okay? But, but it, it is, nothing's perfect, but in aggregate, these tend to be safer for the vehicles and for the pedestrians and for the bicycles who now have a safe place to, drive, to ride their bikes. And uh, you know that's just statistics. Thank you, sir. Anyone else like to speak for the first time, sir? And then I think we'll go second. I think that one good. All right. Um, just a just a statement first is um, in general, drivers these days are in a big rush to go nowhere. <laughs> just the way it is. People go around things in order to gain the extra two seconds to get to nowhere they need to be. Um, Question, is this going to be put in front of a public hearing with the council? We will have, I mean, if we have to endorse it, it'll be in front of the council. Because you guys get to make the decision after. So that, that's probably something you should do. Because these guys are getting beat up for no reason, really. No, no so I agree. So I think they came, so. They, they brought information. It's up to right, the council. So, here, right? so I, I, I recommend that you put this in front of the town as a council meeting with a public hearing to give you guys the public's just feelings of what they want you to do. Second of all, I'd like to put somebody on the spot who's not going to be very happy with me, but um, Chief Fox. <laughs> it sounds like this is going to be a potential issue for you as far as patrols. How do you feel about it? Folks, I went to law school after college. I'm not a roadway design engineer. I, I, I appreciate the vote of confidence. I appreciate the deference. Um, I cannot speak to this with the degree of expertise to satisfy the folks that are here. The very limited research that I have done, uh, very limited research that I have done, which is nothing more than bombing around the web, checking for information on uh, road diet and turn lanes, does seem to indicate the purported safety benefits of doing so. Having said that, I have also heard and spoken to a number of folks from the community, perhaps some of you here, that have offered up the concerns that you've expressed tonight. So anecdotally, I do think there is a uh, significant segment of the community that, that does have these uh, frustrations or at a minimum questions. I wish I could be more uh, concrete for you. 
um, come to me with a legal issue, and that's where I'd like to think that I could excel. And just, just to reiterate, I think did a gentleman's question right. So this is part of the, their paving program, you know, that is going through bonding diet. The word diet is being thrown out there a lot. You know, there is a bonding diet, supposedly, at the state right now. So this really probably isn't anytime soon from just the repaving. So this was the general repaving of Enfield Street. Like I said, you know, this is the when they were going to pave it, they came up with the idea based on their studies. They, you know, we brought it to our traffic division. We spoke about it. We asked them to come here, so you folks could ask the questions from the folks, from the experts. You know, and um, to, to your point, at some point, I'm not sure when that point will be. We will have to have a vote whether we endorse it or we don't. Yeah, you know, I, I mean, I think I don't know if it's that simple, but it may be that simple from a town, from the town perspective. You know, for meeting from the council. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if we vote against it. That means they don't pave. I, I, that's a whole other, I don't want to speak for these guys. I don't think that answer is no, because it's, remember, it's a state road. It's a state road, so, yeah, they are responsible for the paving of it. That's, but you're right, that's how it's going to work. So, again, you guys, I mean, folks have been great, but, you know, but they have come to Enfield to, co to make sure you understand exactly what they were talking about. And, and they're right. This, if you, there is other sections of the, the state in, in a country where these things exist. So it's not just they're picking on Enfield, so to speak. Yeah. So a good question, sir. Uh, I have actually just two questions. So, so is is it is it being said that if if the council votes on it that we can't have it? Can the state override that and change it on their own? I guess I'll defer to you guys on that. <laughs> it is a state-owned and maintained road, so we could do what we want, but. We would go. We would abide by what the town uh, wants to do. We're not. We're not here to make enemies with the town, so we're not going to do anything that they don't want us to do. And the other question is: This the only p spot in the whole town of Enfield that you're going to do this one little diet thing that everybody's got to understand in in the whole town? So, as I said at the beginning, we picked this segment of Route Five for study now because it was subject to paving in 2019. So our study looked at just this piece of Route 5 that was in the paving program so that if the town wanted to support the road diet, that when the state did the paving this summer, which was planned at the time we started the process, that the road diet could be implemented with the paving program at no additional cost. We will be studying the rest of the state roads in Enfield and across the entire state that qualify based on the screening program. And so there could be hundreds of state routes that qualify for road diets and we'll you know, document all that information so that as the state does paving in 2020 and 21 and 22, they'll have a plan in place that they can then seek to implement uh, these systemic safety improvements. So this <clears throat> this project is funded by the federal government out of safety money. Um, so it is it is you know viewed as a safety countermeasure. Um, and so that's why you know we're here today with this piece because it was ready to be paved. So the answer is yes, right now this is the only spot right now. In Enfield. There are other st spots in the state that are also being reviewed now um, and then we'll be doing What's that? In Enfield? No, in other parts of the state are being reviewed for 2019, but there could be other parts of Enfield that are also subject to this program for further review, depending on what we find in the second phase of the process. So we could be back here with other state roads in the future. Enfield. <laughs> Maybe. They may not want to come back. Great, uh, great question. I don't know if you have a... Other state roads don't have the volume that this, this does, so it, won't, it wouldn't qualify, you know, Great question. I mean, actually, very two very good questions. So, I mean, yeah. so I'm sorry. It's going to be the only, eventually it might be, there's a possibility that might be the only mile and a half stretch in the whole town of Enfield that we got to do this on. Just just putting it out there for people to think about. Any other one for the, anyone for the first time have it, who hadn't spoke? I want to make sure we give everyone a chance before we go to second. Anyone going once, going twice? All right, Dave, not Dave, you got to speak specifically on this project, all right? <laughs> Iowa, specifically what, on this project. What, what really specific on no, I mean, project? the potholes in town, we can come on Monday and yell at yeah, the potholes okay. in town. <laughs> all right, first I'm going to say is thank everyone for being here and pay attention to what our council is doing, what our state government is doing, what our taxes, 
and I'm getting to the safety factor part of all this. What you're getting at is making a safer road in Field Street. Is why don't you have more uh, advertisements like Channel Three, Channel Thirty, explaining to drivers: be aware of who's in your lane, correct turn signals. 100 feet before your turn, put your signal lights on. Put those little clips on, 30-second clips on Channel 30 and Channel 3. You got $2.5 million you want to put into the road here, and it doesn't cost that much to put that on the TVs. You, you advertise seat belt, put on click, bickler, click it or click it, and drinking, driving and stuff. Put some things on road caution, roads common courtesy besides no cell phones in that. Put some clips. That you've got the money to spend two and a half million dollars on a road. This is going to be on safety, being common courtesy on the roads and on proper driving. People should get a driver's manual, like I said, from the beginning when they get a driver's license. Some people don't even know how to read the darn thing, and that's important. And being common courtesy, I like to ask about why do you put a hundred percent salt on the roads? Do you days used to be a seven-two mixture, salt and sand and salt? Now, you're putting 100% salt on the roads, is eating up the roads, and it's eating up our bridge. We need plastic bridges. You keep putting that salt, magnesium chloride, and calcium chloride on the wet tanks on the back. I know all about them things. I build them. Now, too much salt on the roads is, is ruining the roads, giving our potholes, and you go on and on and on, and it's ruining the vehicles. Then you buy all brand new vehicles. We've got to buy brand new fire trucks because of the salt on the roads. 24 hours after the, the road, the storm is over, and they always say, hit the bridges heavy, hit the bridges heavy. That goes to the, the crew, uh, the, 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 the manager anything, of the, of the else, district. Anything else on this? Sorry, we can't get into this. This, this is what I'm getting about the road safety, though. I mean, you put, it's got to be specific I, about this project. I, yeah. yeah. I know, because this goes above and beyond is that after the, the, the roads are salted, then you get into. People want to speak. It's got to be okay. this project, sir. Come on. For seven, second, yeah. Thank you all for being here. But look into putting the safety factors on on a TV so everyone can know about driver pre awareness. Deb, then George. Thanks for your Deb will stop the accidents in the roads. Okay. This is not for them. This is for everybody in this room. They will have an answer to every one of our concerns. What we need to do is band together as a community and talk to our council members. Because if we convince them this is a no-go, the state said if the council approves it, they'll do it. If the council doesn't approve it, they'll just repave and keep it the way it is. That's right. I agree with that. Thank you, George. Um, I said my teeth are leaving. You can't leave yet. <laughs> George said you can't leave yet. I'll stand in the corner and wait for George to finish uh, I just want to now talk about some right-hand turn lanes. You've covered everything going left. When you get to the corner of Route 5 and Elm Street, where CVS is, there's always a backup there, especially with the school buses at around 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I understand the eight school buses, five <coughs> school buses. It doesn't matter. And there's people trying to make a right-hand turn at a four-way intersection with signal lights. I now see people cutting through CVS through the lot to get to Elm Street. And if that increased traffic isn't enough, then people will take a right on the previous residential street going north, which is Enfield Avenue. You haven't mentioned Enfield Avenue, but they'll take a right there, go to the end, which is now will be Desnunzio Avenue, <coughs> take a left and go to the end and try to take a right-hand turn on Elm Street if the traffic flow permits, because all the traffic that now going from west to east will already be on there, and anybody that could take a right-hand turn off of Route 5 will also be on that street. You haven't addressed that. Could you address that? So when I talked about Elm Street in the presentation, I mentioned that today you have two through lanes, and so the right-hand through lane is where all the people that want to make a right turn are sitting but they can't make a right turn if there's someone who wants to go through the intersection. So they're sitting behind one person who's at the light. Correct, but under a red light. School buses do not make a right-hand turn. 
I never see them make a right hand turn because they're probably not allowed to. So they're going to be standing there. So are you talking about only when there's a school bus at that intersection? Like, is that the scenario that you're yeah. talking about? Or, or are you talking about well, in total? Line, but especially with school buses. There's about a half a dozen that sit there at that Elm Street light. Are all the school buses making rights? So if the school buses are not making right turns, they'll be in the through lane, and the right turn lane, which is what we're proposing to add a right, an exclusive right turn lane, will be open so that people that want to make a right can get in the right turn lane and make the right on red. If there's only one school <coughs> bus, the they line is backed right up because red. that the cannot make a right hand turn, and you've got the people going from one <coughs> to the east that go through. Understood. I can see them now going down the residential section, yeah. two streets, <coughs> to the stop sign, take a left to another stop sign, and then hopefully they get out to Elm Street. I don't think this is a good situation. I mean, like we said, this is really the community's choice. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, you can, you can take the information that we gave you tonight and, you know, decide how you want to talk to your council. Um, but, you know, we're looking at the corridor in total. So we're not looking for, you know, five minutes in the morning or five minutes in the afternoon or a half an hour when the buses are on the road. We're trying to say, what's the best situation for the traveling public 24-7, 365? So that's, we can't just think about five minutes in the morning when you're delayed for a couple minutes. We have to say, what's safer all the time? And like we've said many times tonight, and I don't, not to be like a broken record, but like Steve said, the data shows that these have been proven to improve safety. And I mean, I can't say it enough, and, and you know, the data is the data, and it's, it will be up to the town to decide what you want the road to be in the future. I mean, that's, that's really where we're at. Seeing that you guys are here, are you going to do anything with Elm Street itself? Is there anything in the plans for Elm Street? So like I said, we're looking at, well, we'll be looking at the rest of the state routes in a second phase of the project. This portion of Route 5 was in the paving program for 2019, so that's why we're looking at this segment now. Because... Uh, so we have a, maybe we, we will and maybe we won't, depending on what the we data tells us. We have a lot us. of traffic that diverts from Hazard Avenue. They come down Elm Street, and then they, you know, they go to the businesses and whatnot. I was just wondering if they were going to do anything with widen the street or, you know. Uh, so you know, I think the good. I'll just say the good news is that they're willing to come here for this project. So if they do have any future projects, we certainly will welcome them back. And hopefully they will come back, right? <laughs> yeah, hopefully they'll come back. Uh, but I mean, I mean, I mean, in fairness, I mean, you folks have been great. But again, remember, they're coming here. They're they're designing a project. They don't know that's why they're coming here locally. And and again, they're willing to come in and, and answer the tough questions. And so I think. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I just again, you guys have been great. But just keep in mind that you know, again, we you're right. We have other projects in town that may or may not be within the near future. This one just happened to be in a 2019 paving program that, again, still may or may not go through because of the, the bonding diet. Okay. Charlie, go ahead. Thank you for coming here because I do appreciate you coming here and giving us the information. It's up to us to talk to our council and to the mayor. Exactly. So I do appreciate it. I just have one question. You keep referring to the second phase. What is the second phase and when does that occur? So the first phase was the 2019 paving program. 
The second phase is the rest of the state of Connecticut, and we should be starting that project this year at some point. So there's nothing imminent in phase two. We haven't even started, but I'm just trying to kind of advise you that this wasn't like a one-off. We're looking at the whole state in, a, in an effort to provide you know, a safer transportation system for the public. So, <clears throat> great job. Uh, yes, uh, I'd like to thank you for being here, Ross. So I, you know, you guys chose probably the worst street that you could have for this project. We have a lot of problems in this town with traffic, and we look to you people to straighten a lot of that out. Of course, we realize you're kind of. Uh, limited to just the state roads. But um, as the way five is, uh, we have other problems other than what, how many lanes we have, i.e. the school buses. It's not the school bus driver, it's where they have to stop. You know, what are the state rules on picking up, dropping off kids? What kind of, uh, how does that influence any neighborhood? We need to solve that as a town, uh, maybe a pull-off or something like that, whatever. There might be some other ideas for it, but it shouldn't change the markings that what you're, ta you're trying to solve some problems with the third lane, but it doesn't really solve them all. And uh, I think that what, what you didn't recognize to start with is the amount of traffic we have to handle going to and from Massachusetts. This, this town is nothing but a gateway. And they use us like crazy here. Don't and remember. Route 5 is the gateway for us. So you start changing the gateway, you're going to change our way of life. And that, that's basically all I have to say. And But other than that, I mean, I understand your data. I understand collecting of data. I'm a management engineer. I did it to, to provide numbers to Congress. So I understand what you go through. And uh, it, and I understand different sets of information, how it can be interpreted in that. Uh, the fact that you never said in your presentation about the uh, number of accidents on 91, that causes us these big overflows through here. And those tolls, if you don't believe that those tolls aren't going to cause us a problem, you're really wrong. I mean, to me, that's almost like a political play that we got here. Uh, you got to take into account the tolls if the governor wants it, you know? Thank you very much. Thank you, Charles. The gateway or the doormat? So, or the doormat? I think we're, we're going to call the public hearing. Let's know if there's anything new to add. I mean, great questions. Really well done. Folks did great. I mean, again, this is a robust public dis debate as it should be. You kept it just to the issue of what you believed in. You weren't personal, so you did a great job. Again, we welcome, we want folks from who affect us in the town to come to town and be able to present. Even if it gets a little bit heated, that's okay. You guys did a great job. Uh, you folks, we appreciate you coming to Enfield. Sorry, sir. One last question. Is anything new? Oh, I mean, I want to get these folks out, right? Sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> In your presentation, you talked about economic development and how this would uh, foster it. Uh, going back again to uh, where it does exist is East Long Meadow, and it hasn't helped there. So, can you tell me how <coughs> this plan? will foster economic development in the town of Enfield? Good question. Just briefly, I, I think what I uh, meant to imply was that uh, it doesn't detract or doesn't hurt communities economically, as some might suggest. It doesn't necessarily suggest that Enfield will have an economic boom from this. But I guess what I'll say, and I'm not here to convince anybody this is your community, um, you design for the place you want. Um, you know, we can make this road four lanes in each direction. Um, that'll just attract more vehicles when I-91 breaks down or when tolls come in or whatever. You, you get what you build for. Um, you want to reduce the number of lanes, 
sure, you're always going to have congestion. You're going to get fewer people that divert. It'll still be congested. Um, but you'll be designing the community you want. You want to design for sidewalks, for people who walk. You want, you want to design for people who maybe have disabilities, for cyclists. Um, that's what you do, and that's what, that's what typically my firm does. Um, I'm not suggesting that's what you all want. You clearly want mobility, and that's okay. Um, we, we're here to hear what you want. But economically, we've seen other communities have benefits, uh, especially from those who do want to live in places where they have mobility options where they don't necessarily need to drive, where they can uh, get on a bus, get on a train, get, um, take a bike. So not saying that'll happen here, but I'm just suggesting that, the, uh, again, we look at the data, and the data shows other communities have benefited from things like this. When you build for traffic, you get traffic. Typically, um, businesses, some businesses do well with traffic, others don't. Traffic going by at 40 miles per hour is not looking for a place to stop. So that's all I'm su suggesting, is that these things don't destroy communities. So oftentimes, they help. So anything else from you guys in closing? We'll wait to hear from you. And folks, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate you coming. Uh, we made it right before 8. And uh, thank you all. Thank you.